Uh, in this session, we will have four interesting presentations. And the first one, titled Fast and Simple Constant Time Hashing to the VLS-12-381 Elliptic Curve by Riyad Wabi and Dan Bonnet. And the presentation is by Riyad. Thank you very much. Uh, so a hash to an elliptic curve is a function that digests an arbitrary bit string and outputs an elliptic curve point. So we're gonna build these things, but first let's talk about why we care about them. So our initial motivation was BLS signatures, and that's a scheme that requires hashing to a pairing-friendly curve like BLS 12 3D1. But in general, there's actually a lot of interest now in deploying protocols that use hash to curve. So for example, there are current working drafts in the IETF for uh, standardizing verifiable random functions, oblivious pseudo-random functions, password authenticated key exchanges, all of those use hash to curve. Uh, and as another example, Cloudflare's Geo Key Manager uses identity-based encryption which also uses hash to curve. So if we're gonna use these things, then it's no surprise that we want them to be fast, right? And probably it's also no surprise that we want them to be constant time because we all know that side channel attacks can be devastating. We have whole sessions on it here. Uh, uh, just to give one recent example, uh, one of these dragon blood attacks against WPA3 was precisely because of non-constant time hashing to elliptic curves. Uh, but what about simplicity? Well, okay, so first I wanna to admit to you that this is a very stylized notion of simplicity. So what I mean is that we should be able to implement one of these hash functions using only fixed modulus arithmetic. Okay, and that kind of makes sense intuitively because that's relatively simple to implement and it'll already have to be there in order to work on the elliptic curve. But beyond that, we, we really want this in the embedded systems context especially because many microcontrollers and smart cards have hardware accelerators for fixed modulus arithmetic and that lets us save energy and go faster. Okay, and finally, we're interested in hashing to the BLS 12 3D1 curve because it's becoming sort of a de facto standard for pairing friendly curves at the 120-ish bit level. And in fact, the IETF is standardizing it, so soon it'll be more than de facto, we hope. Uh, for example, there are ongoing deployments for using it in zero-knowledge proofs, uh, for BLS signatures, et cetera. Uh, okay, so what did we do? Well, first we show a little trick for constructing what we call indirect maps uh, to elliptic curves. And we'll see what we mean by indirect later and why that helps with pairing friendly curves. And second, we give some little tweaks to an existing map uh, by um, uh, Breyer et al. that basically makes this map competitive with the fastest maps to elliptic curves that are constant time. Uh, and the result is a map for which the fastest implementations really are simple and constant time. And taken with the indirect mapping trick, this applies essentially to any elliptic curve. Uh, so finally, we implement and evaluate a bunch of different methods for hashing to BLS 12 3D1. And what we find is that our method is between 1.3 and two times faster than the previous state of the art constant time hash. And we also find that you don't have to pay very much to go from a non-constant time to a constant time hash function. And finally, we've open sourced implementations in several languages. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, uh, we're gonna look at hash functions to elliptic curves, and then I'll tell you about some of the optimizations and some evaluation results. Uh, so, okay, a little notation. As usual, we're gonna use F sub P to refer to the, the field uh, integers mod P, uh, and we'll use H sub P to mean a hash function from arbitrary strings to elements of F P. Uh, and implicitly, we're gonna model this as a random oracle. Now, we're gonna use notation E over F P uh, to mean the group of points on the elliptic curve, so that's uh, solutions to Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B, where X and Y are in the field. Uh, and on these slides, I'm gonna use multiplicative notation for group operations. Uh, and finally, we're gonna say G is a subgroup of E over FP of prime order Q, where Q times H is the size of the whole group and H is the cofactor. Okay, so all this mind-numbing notation out of the way, let's hash to a curve, let's do it. So this procedure is called hash and check. Uh, and the idea is first we're gonna initialize a counter, uh, and then we're gonna, uh, we're gonna while we found, until we found a point, we're gonna loop, and first we're gonna generate a uniformly random candidate x-coordinate by hashing the next value of the counter with our input message, and then we're gonna check whether there's a solution to the curve equation for this x-coordinate. Now if there isn't one, we keep trying, but if there is, that means we found a point on the curve. So now we can just map that curve into the subgroup G with a scalar multiplication by the cofactor, uh, and, and, and we're done, right? Except we're not done because this is really extremely not constant time, right? The message is gonna determine how many times we have to loop, and that means that 
if you watch me hashing, you can learn something. So in fact, this is exactly the problem with, that happened in Dragon Blood. Uh, in there, the message at the input was your password, and if I watched the number of iterations, then I learned something about your password by watching this hash function. Uh, okay, so maybe we could fix this. So as a first order attempt at a fix, let's say, we're gonna say, look, we're gonna accept a small probability of failure, and we're just gonna loop a constant number of times, say 60 times we're gonna loop, uh, and then uh, either at the end of the loop we'll output a result or we'll fail. So that's gonna fail with like probability two to the minus 60, that's fine, but the problem is it's gonna be very slow because we have to loop 60 times, uh, and also there's another insidious issue here, which is you're kind of leaving yourself a tripwire in the code now because if somebody comes along later and says, oh, I could, I could, I could optimize this. Now suddenly your code has gotten optimized to non-constant time. So we don't want that. Okay, what we really want is a deterministic map from a field to points on a curve over that field. And in particular, we're gonna focus today on curves uh, of sort of odd uh, characteristic, which means as long as P is greater than three, uh, we need five for other reasons, uh, we can write the curve equation as Y squared equals XQ plus AX plus B. So every elliptic curve can be uh, expressed that way. Um, and 2001, so there's a rich history of these hash functions. So in 2001, for example, Binet and Franklin showed how to do this pretty cheaply for certain super singular curves uh, over fields with characteristic congruent to two mod three. And then in 2004, 2005, uh, some Polish number theorists, Schinzel and Skalba, uh, started making progress on the more general question of how do we hash to elliptic curves over unrestricted fields. Uh, and, and actually in 2006, Shallow and Van de Vistine built on those results and some, some really beautiful insights to kind of break this problem wide open from a number theory point of view. So they give a fully deterministic map that works for any curve. So that's not the end of the story because that map is relatively expensive. Uh, implemented in constant time, it takes sort of three exponentiations. And so people kind of try, try to keep going. So for example, in 2007, Ulas proposed uh, some modifications that, that simplified things, though it didn't get rid of an exponentiation, but it also cost generality. So now we can only work with curves where A and B are non-zero. In 2009, Eckhart gave what you could kind of view as a generalization of the Bonet and Franklin method, uh, which still requires the characteristic to be congruent to two mod three, but now it works over any, uh, any curve over such a field. Uh, not just super singular curves. Uh, in 2010, Breyer et al. Uh, revisited the shallow Van de Vistine and Ulas work and came up with a nice simplification that also eliminated an exponentiation and they called this the simplified SWU map. Uh, in 2013, building on some work by Farshai et al., uh, Bernstein et al. give a very efficient map called Elegator uh, to curves where B is not zero and which have an even number of points. Okay, so, so I've tried to pack a, a lot of rel work on this slide, but I've totally failed to pack it all. There's a ton of work in this area. Uh, I, so I apologize if I've left yours out. The idea was to sort of get an idea of the landscape. And the question is, where does our work fit in? Well, okay, so we generalize and optimize the simplified SWU map of Briar et al. 2010. Uh, so, so for curves with non-zero A and B, uh, we can match the best existing algorithms, one exponentiation. Uh, and if we remove the restrictions on A and B, then we can still get uh, to just a little bit more than one exponentiation. And we're gonna see where that a little bit more comes from a little later in the talk. But remember, the goal originally was to hash to BLS1231, so let's kind of look at how these things stack up. So uh, the, the field characteristic is uh, congruent to one mod three, so that rules out Bonet and Franklin and then the Eckhart method. Um, a is equal to zero, so that rules out SWU and simplified SWU. And BLS1231 has odd order, so that rules out Elegator. And so we're left with only the one that works for every curve, with the uh, shallow and Van de Vistine. Um, and that one really does work, but we can, we can make it a little more efficient, and that's what, that's what this work does. Um, so before we talk about the optimizations that make this possible, let's, let's, this was just a deterministic map. Let's make it into a hash function. Uh, so uh, you probably guessed already that we can compose HP with a deterministic map M in kind of a natural way, right? So first, we're gonna hash to the base field using HP, and then we're gonna map from there to a point on the curve using M, and finally we can clear the cofactor and return a result. So this is nice and simple, but there's a small snag, and that is we've been discussing these deterministic maps, but I haven't made any promises about what the output distribution of the map looks like. Uh, and we can kind of guess, just heuristically, that probably it's not a bijection, and that's true, and the reason is this. In order for it to be a bijection, it would have to be the case that the number of points on the curve and the field characteristic are the same, and that means that it's an anomalous curve, and we never use those for crypto because discrete law is easy. So that means for any curve we care about for cryptography, we're not gonna have a bijection. And in fact, we can go further than that. The map is pretty lumpy looking. Uh, but actually, um, 
had the hash to curve, so, so this hash to curve function is non-uniform in its output. That's why we called it MU. Uh, so it turns out this isn't a disaster for a lot of protocols. Like many protocols, this is totally fine. Maybe there's a small loss in security, but usually it's, it's, it's really small. Um, but, but sometimes we really do need uniformity, and it's much easier to think about things if we can just say, oh, this is a random oracle. So what if we want a random oracle? Well, in that case, uh, there's uh, Breyer et al. and Farshai et al. Uh, sort of did a bunch of work on this, and, and what they show is that um, if we evaluate the map twice on independent inputs and sum the result, then we get something that is extremely close to uniform. Uh, so in particular, since we're modeling HP as a random oracle, we can do something very simple. We just prepend zero and one to the string to get two new strings, and then we hash those, add them together, done. Um, so for this to work, the map M needs to be what's called well-distributed. And I'm not gonna define that uh, precisely, but you can kind of think of this as, well, M isn't too lumpy. Uh, and the technical result that we get if M is not too lumpy is that uh, the hash to curve function is indifferentiable from a random oracle. So if you need a random oracle, you can build one basically this way. Okay, so now we know how to build one, but let's see how we can do a little better. Let's see how we can go a little faster. So uh, remember, we're working over uh, an elliptic curve. We're gonna say, say y squared equals xq plus ax plus b, but that's a mouthful. So we'll just say y squared equals f of x. Um, and at a high level, the idea behind the simplified SWU map is we're gonna construct a pair of candidate x coordinates. And then we're gonna be guaranteed by the construction that one or the other will be a point on the curve. So specifically imagine that we're gonna pick an x coordinate and a non-square u such that either x or u times x is, a, is an x coordinate of a point on a curve. Then the way we're gonna do that is uh, by choosing x and u such that f of u times x is equal to u cubed times f of x. And what this implies is that since u cubed is non-square, if uh, f of x is non-square, then u cubed times f of x is square. So this means we do get the point, one of those is gonna be a point on the curve. So we can just write out the equality that we want and grind through a little bit of uh, arithmetic. Uh, and and uh, this gives us a parameterization in terms of non-squares u, which is half the field, but we wanted a map from the whole field. So what do we do? Well, okay, let's assume that p is uh, congruent to three mod four, in which case negative one is non-square. So then we can say for any input in the field t, negative t squared is non-square, that's our u, off we go. So now we have a, sort of a map, we have two functions that are parameterized over fp, any point t on which these functions are defined guarantees us that one of the two functions will give us a, an x-coordinate on the curve. Okay, so let's implement this. So the idea is we're gonna evaluate x0 and x1, check which one we wanna output, and output it. So uh, to start, we're gonna evaluate x, uh, x0, f of x0, and then compute a square root. And since p is congruent to three mod four, we can compute a square root by exponentiating by p plus one over four. Uh, and then we're gonna do the same thing with x1, and we have to do another square root. And finally, we're gonna check which one is square and return the corresponding point. So this works, but remember, we're, we're, we're aiming for a constant time implementation, which means that no matter what, we have to compute both square roots. So that's two exponentiations, and the goal is to try and get down to one. So we're gonna go back to the definition of the map and rewrite f of x one in terms of t and f of x zero. And similarly, we can rewrite the expensive piece that we're gonna try and get rid of, and when we do that, what we find is this expensive piece is just equal to t cubed times the square root of negative f of x zero. So that's very close to what we computed already, right? We tried to compute a square root of f of x zero. So let's see what happened with that. So if we square the thing that we attempted to call a square root, then what we get out of it is f of x zero times the Legendre symbol of f of x zero. And so of course, if f of x zero is square, then the Legendre symbol is one, and we did actually find a square root. But if f of x zero is not square, then what we found was actually the square root of negative f of x zero, which is exactly the value that we wanted. So it, we already computed it. All we have to do is plug that back into the implementation. So the only thing that changes is line four. We can do a cheap uh, multiplication instead of an exponentiation, and boom, we're down to one exponentiation. So are we done? Well, kind of. So I swept one thing under the rug, and that is that x zero, the function, required uh, computing uh, a ratio. And so that seems like we're gonna have to do a modular inversion, which feels like an exponentiation. Of course, in the next talk, oh, sorry for spoilers, we're gonna learn how to do that in constant time without computing an exponentiation. But for now, we can actually do something much simpler. Uh, and that is, we can just work in projective coordinates. So instead of computing the, the value of the ratio, we just keep the numerator and denominator separate. And then prior work shows how we can take those two, those separate values and turn it into one square root. Uh, and finally, what I've showed you is specialized to the three mod four case, but it turns out that this is quite straightforward to generalize. Okay, so we're down to one, to one exponentiation. So now the, the, the remaining problem is we still only support curves where A and B are not zero. Uh, 
So how do we get to zero? How do we get that, that last piece? So to get around this, we're gonna find a new curve, E prime, where A and B are non-zero, and we're gonna require that there's an efficiently computable homomorphism from E prime to E. And, and that's the curve that we really wanted. So to do that, it's actually quite simple. We're just gonna search through the isogeny space around E until we find a low degree isogeny where the, the, the codomain has A and B not equal to zero. And that automatically gives us an efficiently computable homomorphism. So specifically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna evaluate the simplified SWU map to E prime, and then we're gonna evaluate the isogeny map to E, and we're done. Um, so there's one thing that we have to worry about, and that is um, we have to make sure we don't break the well-distributedness property of the simplified SWU map, because remember, we needed that for the uniform hashing to work. Uh, but it turns out that this is kind of immediate. As long as the degree of the isogeny is co-prime to the order of the subgroup, this is, this is totally fine. The, the, the well-distributedness applies. And meanwhile, remember, the order of the subgroup is some 256-bit prime, so we better hope that, the, that D is co-prime to that, otherwise we're in trouble. Uh, so this is what I meant when I said one plus earlier. We have to first evaluate the simplified SWU map in one exponentiation, plus we have to evaluate an isogeny map. That's cheap. Uh, how cheap? Well, let's look at some evaluation results. Okay, so we implemented hashes to BLS 12 3D1. Uh, that's a pairing-friendly curve, which means that it actually defines two groups. Uh, and uh, we, we implemented for both groups. Uh, we actually implemented a bunch of different stuff. So we implemented hash and check, shallow and van der Boostien, uh, uh, and our work. And for each of those, we implemented a few different styles. Uh, we implemented uh, one that uses uh, libgmp in sort of full generality, one that uses only field operations but is not constant time, one that uses field operations and is constant time. And then we also looked at non-uniform hashing and uniform hashing and all this. But I'm not gonna show you all of that because there's just not time. Uh, I'm gonna look at, we're gonna look at uh, the hash to G1 uniformly, uh, and the other results are very similar. Uh, but in total, this is about 3,500 lines of C uh, that's open source, and uh, it's constant time field arithmetic, curve operations, cofactor clearing, et cetera. Uh, and we, just, just to let you know, we tested with hyper-threading and frequency scaling disabled, which is very important. Uh, and we run all the hash functions on the same pseudo-random sequence of a million inputs and record the number of uh, CPU cycles that each iteration takes. Okay, so here are the results. Um, the first group of bars on the left is hash and check. The second group of bars is the worst 10% of the hash and check runs. So remember, with hash and check, some inputs are bad. And so what we want to know is how bad do they get? Like, what's the, what does the tail look like? And so we, we just choose the, the worst 10% of the, of the million runs. Uh, the third group of bars is shallow and van and the rightmost group uh, is, is our work. Um, and then within each group, the blue line, the, the dark blue uh, uses libgmp, and the important thing there is that we get a very fast Legendre symbol computation. So that means checking for squareness is cheap. Um, the light blue line is field operations but not requiring constant time, and then the magenta line is uh, fully constant time. And some of these it didn't make sense to implement, right? I, I, we talked earlier about how hash and check in constant time would be kind of ridiculous. I, I, I computed it earlier, and I think at this scale, the bar for hash and check would be like on the 53rd floor. So like, it wouldn't fit on the slide. Um, and also, there's no point in, uh, in using the full power of libgmp for our work because we don't need a Legendre symbol. So we didn't, we didn't look at that either. It would be exactly the same as the light blue line. Uh, so okay, a few takeaways here. So first of all, the, the tails for hash and check really are quite bad if you're restricted to only field operations, right? So this is the worst 10%, and it's sort of 2x the, the average case. Another thing to take away is the shallow and van der Wusting map, as we expected, um, if we have to do it in constant time, it's pretty slow, because remember, we have to compute three exponentiations. It's not quite 3x because there's a fixed cost of like, uh, you know, uh, mostly clearing the cofactor and things like this. Uh, and finally, it, it, our work, well, the cost of going from non-constant time to constant time is quite, is very small. And beyond that, like comparing the constant time version of our work to the non-constant time version of Shallow and Van der Boostien, there's like sort of a 9% overhead or something. So uh, really, the, the simple and constant time implementations are pretty fast. Uh, okay, so let's recap. We optimized the simplified SWU map, and we extended it to apply to essentially any curve. And from the evaluation, we can see that fast implementations can still be simple and constant time. So the high-level takeaway is, whereas previously only curves that were compatible with Elegator or Ecart could be hashed to in one exponentiation, uh, now you can do that for essentially any curve. Uh, and this means that pairing-friendly curve families, uh, the NIST curves, uh, sec P256K1, which Bitcoin uses, you can hash to any of those with one exponentiation worth of cost uh, and in constant time.
Uh, so finally, all of our code is open sourced, and we'd be, we'd be psyched if you checked it out. We're happy to talk more about it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are a few different languages. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Apparently not working. Now it works. Um, nice result, thank you. I wonder, um, in, in your situation, Hessian curve is all you want. What if you addition need to have a Mac back? Like, you need injectivity. How much can you rescue from this? Uh, what can you do with this? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you for the question. So the question is, uh, Elegator actually shows two results, and I only mentioned one of them. Uh, one result is forwards from the, the string to the curve. The other is backwards from the curve point to a uniformly random string. Uh, sorry, just a little background. Uh, so. Uh, there's, there's some follow-on work, as I'm sure you know, called Alligator Squared, um, and this map is, is still totally compatible with Alligator Squared. So uh, you can sort of, it, it doubles the length uh, compared to Alligator, uh, but uh, yeah, you can still get uniformly random uh, strings backwards from the curve points. Any other questions? Well, you mentioned, uh, I have a question, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, there is a uh, standardization effort for parents, right? I think, I believe by IETF. Are they aware of these results? Uh, yeah, there's actually also a, a standardization effort for uh, hash to curves, uh, and, and this will be included, I think, for some of them. So I think, uh, for example, P256, one of the recommended methods will be this one. Okay, great. Let's thank the speaker again, please. Thank you.